Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back to another edition of Rock the Stage Show. It's Sunday night, 7 o'clock, every Sunday night. We're back streaming once again and having great discussions with amazing people from around the world, from actors, directors, celebrities, authors, you name it. We have it right here on Rock the Stage. And, of course, we're streaming on two different platforms now. We're on PPN, the Public Place Network, and on our usual YouTube channel as well. Make sure you come in. Join us. Sunday nights, it's premiere night. And premiere night, you can add your comments or thoughts right in the chat and join the discussion with us on YouTube. But tonight, we got a great one for you. We're going to have lots of fun tonight. And you may also laugh a little bit tonight. You may actually smile and think, I feel good. And that's a good thing. But before we get into that, let me ask you a question here. Are you driven or are you drawn? Just let that ponder for a second. Are you driven or are you drawn? It's a powerful and challenging question. Here's another question for you tonight. If you could reinvent yourself, how would you do it? And what would happen if you could reinvent yourself? And finally, one more question. How do you see life? Is it a magical adventure or is it a draining, boring existence? <laughs> Tonight, my guest has asked and answered all these questions and much more. She lives a truly magical life and she's not done yet, by the way. Diana Wentworth is my guest tonight, a New York Times bestselling author of 10 books, including Send Me Someone, Chicken Soup for the Soul Cookbook, and many, many others. Her latest talk centers around how our society has become increasingly tolerant of ugliness and blind to beauty. Now, Diana speaks to why it does not have to be that way, but she's also reinvented herself and reinvented her brand. And you're going to hear an amazing story tonight of how you embrace life live life to the fullest, and live it as a great adventure tonight. Diana Wentworth, welcome to Rock the Stage Show tonight. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you, Richard. <laughs> that is great to have you with us. And again, we were talking backstage. We have a lot of fun things in common. And number one thing is we love magical, adventurous lives. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm curious, how did you fall into that? Because I tell people every day is a new adventure. But how did you get there? Oh, my gosh. Well, I had to look back at my life. I'm 83. So I'm looking back at my life and really noticing uh, how magical it's been. In fact, I asked a man one time who was so interesting. He was an elder. This is years ago. And I said, tell me, what is the most important thing you ever realized in your life, you ever learned? He said, expect magic. And that just, I don't know, that just went right through my heart and it stayed with me. And I just have to, you know, say that my life has just been one continual magical event after another. Well, from what I know of you, and it's amazing, you worked with Mark Victor Hansen and with Jack Hanfield on the first Chicken Soup for the Soul cookbook. And you went 11 million copies sold. How's that for a great magical ride? Oh, my God. It was unbelievable. I knew Jack and Mark uh, because they joined an organization called the Inside Edge that my first late husband and I uh, started. And we were there when they got the idea to do it and all of that. And everybody thought Chicken Soup for the Soul was a cookbook just because of the title. And the publisher said, we have to have a cookbook. And Jack and Mark kept saying no. But Paul and I had written six cookbooks, one of which had won Cookbook of the Year. And so they called me on the phone and they said, Diana, you're going to do the chicken soup for this whole cookbook. Get right over here to this hotel. Bring your cookbooks. The publisher, we're going to do this. And that turned out to be such a the most fabulous publishing opportunity I ever had because it immediately sold a million books. And they gave me a third of the book. So... Well, and again, both those gentlemen, if anyone's ever heard them speak, they're mm -hmm. both rock stars. And to go hang out and do what you did, that had to be a lot of fun. That was just one of the magical events. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, though, you have been a celebrity and entertainment chef as well. So you mentioned the cookbook, but you've also been on TV and having fun in that arena. What's that been about? 
Well, we had, uh, Paul and I had our six cookbooks. We had a, a school on sun, on the Sunset Strip where Wolfgang Puck would teach. We had our own TV show. Uh, and this was all during the time, you know, when, when that was the thing to do. Home entertaining was the big deal. Oh, yeah. And uh, Martha Stewart and I were featured on in House and Garden magazine as the cooking experts, East and West. That's not a bad crowd to be in. I know, but you know, like every wave that goes up, it begins to go down. And women went into the workforce big time in 1985 and uh, nobody wanted to cook meals anymore. And we realized that, that that wasn't our calling. We suddenly had the realization because we were invited to go into the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War on a peace mission with some very famous people. Wow. We had Dennis Weaver and Mike Farrell from MASH and the real Patch Adams and Barbara Marks Hubbard. And it was terrifying and wonderful, but we realized that all those people began sharing resources around the table. And we suddenly realized that it was never really about the food. What we loved was getting people together and having people have really deep, connecting conversations, yes. support each other and cheer each other on. So then we started this breakfast forum where Jack and Mark and Louise Hay and and um, of Dr. Susan Jeffers, we used to give these parties where you had to show up as who you were going to be in five years. And Susan showed up in a limousine with three mock book covers and said she just returned from her third New York Times bestseller tour. And she actually did that. Her first book that came out was called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And she became world famous with that. So there was just a magic involved in, in people just getting together for all the right reasons, listening to inspiring speakers, which we provided and, and uh, supporting each other and going for their dreams. Well, and, and isn't that what life should be? Yeah. People getting around laughing, joking, dreaming, and then empowering each other, encouraging each other to say, go do it. Yes, 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 yes. That's what I want to be. I just want to ignite joy and, and uh, positivity in the world. And um, gosh, you know, I was just, I was widowed three years ago. Mm -hmm. And it gave me time uh, for the first, I had been married for 56 years because uh, my first husband promised to send me someone when he was passing. And Which is incredible, <laughs> unbelievably incredible to think of that mindset. And he did right away. So I was married for 56 years with just an eight-month intermission. Um, had a double feature there. <laughs> uh, but I had never really experienced, you know, my own sovereignty. Mm. Because there's in a relationship, you are always accommodating other people's preferences and likes and dislikes. And I had suddenly a whole lot of time to withdraw from the world and to claim no, some new space for myself. Mm. And I began to notice that I was sort of a prisoner of my stuff, that there was a storage unit, there was this condo, there were books that I had read years ago souvenirs and just tax records, you know, and all this stuff to just accumulate. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, who would I be without all this? Uh, could this be an opportunity to just kind of lighten up and uh, be lighthearted? How playful could yeah. I be yeah. if I didn't have all of this? So you are talking to me just as I have been through like a nine month gestation Wow. I'm getting rid of all of my stuff. 90% of my stuff is gone. Yeah. The moving truck comes day after tomorrow. And I'm not sure where I'm going, but I'm going on, I'm going to have an entirely new adventure. Well, and again, that's what we opened up with. And you, you've also found that road to surrender, you, which <laughs> ties into your new brand. You're, you're into that joy. You're all about joy and adventure and, you're really branding yourself to that's right. go for it, aren't you? Yes. Yes. That's what I want to be known for. I don't want to be significant anymore or unapproachable. Mm -hmm. I just want to be playful. And I just remember as kids, remember how we used to just laugh till we would just think oh. we were going to die of laughing? I still do. And I get in trouble for it. 
<laughs> as an adult, just so you know, I still laugh at those things. Well, I, I think I'm in love with you, Richard. <laughs> That was a really fabulous quality. I really love the idea of just being spontaneous and being playful. One time I asked my my first husband, who was just my absolute soulmate, and I, I said, what is my best quality? And he said, oh, that's such an important question. I'm going to think about that. I'll tell you tomorrow. So the next day he said, your most important quality is your playfulness. And that came up again for me right now. And I thought, I have to reclaim that. I have to feel that again. And that will not only serve me, but it'll serve the world. Well, and what is it that we do? We, we're, we're kids. We're free. We're playful. We're climbing trees. We're building forts. We're imagining things in the backyard that aren't really there. Right. And somewhere we grow up. Yeah. And I talk to more people in their adult years to say, I secretly want to be a kid again. Yeah. And you're actually giving us permission to do it. Oh, so completely giving permission to do it. I went to, somebody has invited me over the other night to say goodbye. And the whole group there just talked about the recent operation and how awful things were and what we'd all been through. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have to stop this now. Because what we need to focus on is what I call quantum questions. These are questions that have a vibration of the solution that you really want. Ooh. So I, I call this, um, I call these quantum questions. So every morning when I wake up now, I, I before I, I even let the parade of horribles start marching through my mind about what I have to do today, I say, how much joy can I experience today? Where's the most joy today? And something about that, you know, I smile at the same time and yeah. that gets the endorphins going and it, it just starts something happening. And when you are living in a, a more expanded question like that, expecting an answer, expecting magic, that answers begin to flow in or just ideas of somebody that you could reach out to or something you could do that would be fun that you could program into your calendar. And so I kind of live in that. It's kind of a liminal space. Yeah. But that's the, that's where the juice is. That's where I'm finding so much inspiration. Well, and some of this is mindset. Some of it is, like you said, you get out of bed and you start right away before the phone call, before this, before even the first coffee, you start out thinking today's a great adventure. Yes. So something magical is going to happen. And now I'm looking for it. Now that's I'm like thinking, what am I going to bump into? And when it happens, I'm going to fully embrace it. That's right. Absolutely. That's it. Why, why don't we do that naturally? What, what is keeping us from, because we all want a joyful life. We, we all want to have fun more because there's so much doom and gloom in the world. I know we want it, but why don't we do it? Well, you know, I think it's, there's always this battle going on inside between ego and essence. And ego is important. We need, to, we need to keep ourselves safe. We need to feel secure in the world. But it's got this voice running all the time about, well, what if that happens? Or what if that happens? And it, it's a voice of fear. And that fear just runs if we don't catch it, if we don't just take a breath and stand back from it and realize that that isn't the truth. Um, the truth is always in what's happening right this minute and how can I find the beauty in this moment? What could, what could possibly be born just because I decide that I'm open and expectant and uh, of the highest good that come in? Yeah. Well, how many opportunities have we missed because we weren't doing it the way you just described it? Yeah. How many have flown by and we get home and go, I think I should have done this back there. And we I know. Kick ourselves oh. in the backside for it, don't we? I know. All that hindsight, too, though, is just a lot of noise that we create. Mm. So I try, I really, really try and don't succeed all the time uh, to be in my essence, which is playful and joyful and curious and in a state of wonder especially when I encounter beauty, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I've always been kind of a hothouse flower, not that athletic, not that much of an outdoors person, 
but I'm doing a lot more walking now and really just stopping in, in sort of a state of awe at just the bark on a tree mm -hmm. or uh, flowers or colors. And it's almost like there's a fourth dimension, you know, it's like our, our peripheral vision mm -hmm. comes much more into play when we're in expanded state yeah. and when we actually see things or hear things or smell things. All the orange blossoms are in bloom right now here in Palm Springs where I live. Yeah. And when I step outside, the fragrance is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But I've been so ambitious in my life, looking into the future, thinking, well, I'll, I'll be happy when this happens. Or I need that to happen in order for me to feel financially secure or all of that. And all of that is just the ego running wild and making a whole lot of static in our brains. Interesting, because the cherry blossom just bloomed here in D.C., and yeah, the, the smell, the color, and they don't last long, but the intensity is so brilliant. You have to go suck it in. You have to just stand by a tree and you, they don't want you to touch them because they want everyone to enjoy them. So you just watch the beauty. Yes. It's gorgeous. You just take it in. Yes. Yes. How, how simple is that? But how hard is that to stop and simply smell the roses as it were? <laughs> well, it does, it does take, it takes, um, it takes commitment, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, it really takes commitment to when you when you see it, when you first catch it, just to stop back and say, "Hey, ah, oh, everything really is all right in this particular moment." Yeah. And what could make this moment even better? Well, and you know, people are coming out of COVID. We're coming out of some tough times, and the word we all heard was "pivot." I don't like the word, but I like reinventing. Mm -hmm. We've all been reinventing ourselves, and more and more people, I think, are getting to the point where where you're discussing it. Um, is it okay for me to have fun and still be a Fortune 500 company? Is it okay for me to say I'm not going to that board meeting? My kid's got a baseball game. Is it okay? And I think more of us are waking up to the fact of pandemic had us stay home, and we got to do dinner with our family. We got to play ball in the backyard. Mm -hmm. I think we fell back into something we were long missing, weren't we? I do. I do. And, you know, when I look back on my life, there has been so much synchronicity. I mean, I don't want to go into any of my old stories, but the, uh, just a couple of things as an example that gave me the idea when I began to see that there really is magic afoot, that there must be some sort of grand design that we will never really understand. I was 18 and I was um, in a sorority at UCLA. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I announced to my my sorority sisters for some reason that uh, I was someday going to date Elvis Presley, which was I mean I couldn't believe I'd said that. And he was in the army <laughs> in Germany at the time, I, and uh, that was all, of course impossible. And I I just wondered where that came from. But actually, about six weeks later, I was on his arm. He was in his army uniform. Uh, taking me into a nightclub in Paris. So that kind of triggered an idea in me of, hey, wait a minute, you know, how could I possibly have known that? And then I was engaged uh, when I was 21 to a man, suddenly had the realization that this wasn't going to be good because I wanted a real soulmate. I wanted mm -hmm. somebody who was just my my really sole partner in the world who i could just be truly at home with yes. and uh, my parents were leaving on a sudden trip to asia and i tagged along at the last minute the trip was amazing and our last stop was hong kong i woke up in the morning and i thought oh, I, i've got to get dressed up in my very best dress and go stand downstairs in the lobby there's something that i need to be there for and I just did that, and I was standing there wondering why I was there. And the elevator door opened, and out walked probably the most handsome man I'd ever seen. And that was Paul von Wellenatz. The person he was with was called to the telephone, so he was left standing close to me. He walked over to me, asked where I was from, and we were engaged three days later. <laughs> so, wow. I, mean, I, have, I mean, my... I've written about this in, in several yeah. of my 
books, but these are my old stories and I try not to fall into them, but still there was this feeling that I could trust the magic, that there yeah. was something that was guiding me, that I would, if I would just stay tuned, if I would just be curious about it and open, that my life would go beautifully. And it has. I've had, I've had a miracle life. Well, and the curiosity, I think, is part of it. I, I don't think we're curious enough we used to be. We have, we have a click of a button and we get our news. We can get this and that. Yeah. It's all done so easy for us. But curiosity is something that you really, I think, need to have to go peek around the corner, that, that, to go ask that next question, to do the follow-up. We're, we're just not curious anymore, are we? We're not. We need to be in a state of wonder. I think yeah. there's a new book out on, on just the state of awe. And yeah. what, what is that like? Well, when yeah. was the last time you were awed? When was the last time you literally stopped and went, oh, you know, jaw dropper? I'm right this minute being <laughs> with you, <laughs> talking about this wonderful subject. I mean, where does this even come from? That that we get to talk about this, the, that this is the most important thing in my life right now, this state of awe, this state of joy, this state of... Uh, laughter and appreciation and celebration. Um, this is the moment right now. I told you know, and that whole reinvention part of it. Mm -hmm. People do dream of reinventing. People mm -hmm. are trying to build new companies, new families, new marriages. But some people feel I can't. I'm not allowed to. Uh, this is the path. This is where I'm at. And if I reinvent myself, I'm going to fall down. So instead of reinventing yourself, you stay in the lane you're already stuck in. But You've been married twice. You've had amazing adventures. You've written books. If you hadn't have stepped out of your box, if you hadn't have stepped out into that moment where you felt it, probably none of that would have really, really happened, right? It wouldn't. And, you know, there's something that I call dark beauty uh, because we all have terrible challenges in our lives sometimes and great losses. Yep. Uh, I There was a time when twice actually when we were wiped out financially and had to reinvent ourselves or the time when my beautiful first husband Paul Van Ron, that's when he was diagnosed with cancer and in four months later he was gone but even within those moments of what I call dark beauty yeah. there is a rich poignancy of the love that has been um, the appreciation for that, the, um, the struggle, you know, I, I have a saying, there's no breakdown, no breakthrough without a breakdown. And that has proven itself over and over in my life. Mm -hmm. So when I am in a state of absolute breakdown, it's almost like, you know, the caterpillar, I've always loved that, that metaphor. Yeah. The caterpillar somehow has an inner trigger that makes it just melt it has this protective cocoon and it goes inside and it it dissolves into absolute nothingness and out of that somehow there's something that's reconstructed that is so much more beautiful and if we can remember in those times of great sorrow and great loss that something new is being born in us. I think that we can trust that. I don't think you learn that young. You know, you don't learn that as a no, kid. No. So. Now, when it comes to reinvention, you, you've had to go through, I mean, married twice, lost both husbands, you've gone through career, career changes. What's the best piece of advice you can give somebody when it comes to reinventing? Oh, my gosh. Um, Make joy your compass. <laughs> the new brand is working right here, everybody. Here we go. Right Listen here. up. Yeah. Make joy your compass. And it's really hard sometimes. I know how hard it is. And I, I'm not saying that I don't have, I don't have times when I'm full of grief or sadness or have tears. But I've just learning to trust that there is always that. This too shall pass. You know, this is not how you're going to feel for the rest of your life. There's going, there's light at the end of the tunnel that's not just an oncoming train. 
that yeah. there's um, that there's always beauty as a touchstone. And if we look around and we appreciate, you know, there's so much grief in the world right now. Mm -hmm. There's so much pain and suffering happening. And yet right where we are in the moment, we're probably really comfortable. We know where our next meal is. We have a soft pillow to put our head on. So of course, gratitude is a magical thing, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's, it's a state of mind that reminds us that we're okay. It's, it's, it's okay. And I think of Louise Hay, who became a very good friend of mine and came to stay with me several times. And she would say, she had a mantra that said, all is well, all is well. Everything is happening for my highest good right now. And I am safe. And I call those words in sometimes just because I need to hear them. Well, and you know, going back to the beginning where I talked about surrender. It's one of the scariest, most liberating things in the world to surrender and say, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm okay, but I'm going to go forward and surrender to the chaos, the change. The It's something about going through that. Again, you do come out transformed in some way. Yes. But, it, but it's the act of surrender instead of fighting it always. Sometimes you're fighting the best thing in the world, but you don't know you're fighting the best thing in the world. That's right. It's so true. You know, my first book was called Send Me Someone, as you mentioned. But I was going to start it. I've been starting a new book. And it is called The Road Trip to Surrender. And it's going to be an exploration of, you know, who might I visit? What synchronicities might I find out there? And there's this playfulness coming up in me. <clears throat> you know, Iris Apfel, do you know who she was? She just died. She was 103. She was a fashion icon. And she would wear all these crazy, outrageous outfits that when people, I mean, she became incredibly internationally famous mm -hmm. and she would have on 15 necklaces and her colors were just so playful and i decided to play around as i was getting rid of my clothes and keep only those things that really made me happy yeah that were colorful or that felt good and wearing more of them all at the same time i just had a photo shoot yesterday with all sorts of crazy outfits and flowers in my hair and just trying to explore what new part of me wants to emerge uh, and show up as playful in this world. Because you know what it is? It's just contagious. It is. It's just contagious. And that's what I want. I walk into markets now and I just wonder as I go in, you know, maybe there's something I could say to somebody that would just be something they'd remember all their life instead of walking in with my mm -hmm. head down or looking at my marketing list, um, how might I ignite some kind of inspiration in somebody? And back, I had a heart attack. I don't think I've, I've told this very much, but I had a heart attack about 20 years ago, okay. no, 15 years ago. It happened suddenly. It was about a week before I was supposed to leave on a cruise. And if I'd had the heart attack on the cruise, I wouldn't be here with you. Gotcha. So the timing was perfect. Uh, my husband got me right to the hospital. I was only there 36 hours. They put three long stents into my heart. And it was almost like a non-event, except that it really woke me up uh, to what my life had been about, what mattered. And they told me to do a lot of walking and I've always multitasked. So I thought, well, what can I do while I'm walking? And I, I had started a collection of poetry that, that was almost like a mantra. Poetry has a way of moving us into a whole new way of seeing. Mm. And so I thought, well, what are my favorite poems? Why don't I memorize them by heart? Because then if my ego is quacking away about something, Maybe I could just recite one of those poems to myself. So I memorized a new poem for a whole year. Okay. 
And um, the one that comes to me that feels so appropriate to our conversation here is by a poet named Hafez. Uh, he lived a hundred years after Rumi. He was one of these mystical poets, a Sufi poet. And he, this is my, this poem just goes through my head all the time now, <laughs> all the time. Well, you want to share it with us? I am. I'm going to share it with you. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart is too heavy for me to remember that I've been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to laugh, to be lifted up and to lift others up. Oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. That's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. And I don't know, you can't hear that without smiling. You can't hear that without having your feet move a little bit and go, yeah, could be. That's a beautiful picture. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're so welcome. I love that. I was happy I got to share it. <laughs> now, be before we, I, I do want to slide in two other things because you and your first husband founded the Inside Edge Foundation for Education. Right. Now, it's a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. You inspire self awareness, personal growth, education, community engagement, mutual empowerment. So much of it was powered into that. Why did you guys get into that? So I had a sort of a spiritual mindset and I was always curious about what could make life better and what was the meaning of life. In fact, I remember my family one time looking at a cartoon where somebody had crawled up the mountain to the guru and said, what is the meaning of life? And we thought that was the funniest thing, question anybody could ever ask because how could you ever understand that? But I think that all of us have a feeling that there really is somewhere that is home. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I was always curious about that. And as we were having our cooking career, as I said, we began to realize that what mattered more was the joy of connecting people around the table yes. and people getting to know each other and discover new ideas and find out what they had in common and encourage each other. Yeah. So we didn't have to cook the food anymore. When we, we went to the Beverly Hills Hotel, we got a great deal at, for having one of the big ballrooms. We would have 200 people show up in the morning. This is before the internet, you know. Wow. The, we, would, uh, we just sent out a few invitations in the beginning and invited people that we had met, Barbara DeAngelis and Jack Canfield and so on. And then they invited people and people just showed up. I mean, it was 6.30 in the morning. And so it was like power breakfast that we're starting in New York where people were starting to network. Yeah. But we thought, why couldn't we use networking for the human potential movement, which was just beginning to emerge, gotcha. where we would have great speakers and people could come and be sparked and inspired. And we could have always close with some kind of a fun entertainer. It would be a singer or a mime or Swami Beyond Ananda who would make us laugh. Mm -hmm. And it just became something that spread by word of mouth. It and was, that was one of those magical gatherings, right? It was. I, there had never been anything like it before. And um, actually, the, the idea came from I was in a group and a woman said, In a few minutes, I'm going to point to somebody in this room and they're going to be transported five years ahead. And they're going to tell us what they see. And I was the person she pointed at. And I said, I don't know what it is. It's a ballroom. There are people there. And everybody's excited that, that Paul and I created this. But I don't know what it is yet. But it's fabulous. And people love it. And that's all I could see. And then it gradually came into focus like a Polaroid picture, you know. You have to kind of wait for it to develop. But I began to see that that we could just be the hosts of this thing instead of hosting dinner parties 
that we could host gatherings. Mm -hmm. So that was it. I mean, it really was quite magical. Well, and that's how those things happen. Again, you 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 see it, and then you start stepping into it. You start creating your own future. You're creating your own joy. Yes, and you know the Inside Edge lasted for 39 years. And there's something else called the Mastery Circle International that meets weekly on Zoom that is an offshoot of that. So just that one idea had tremendous uh, survival. That's my legacy. Yeah. And and people still thank me just because the people got met and got married there. I mean, it was just, it was incredible. It was such well, a Well, another magical, contagious thing, right? It was a playground. <laughs> I like to create a playground for people. <laughs> that's it. Now, you also have, uh, you're, you're really big about a new app that's out there, uh, Newcom. Yeah. But it's music with a purpose. Can you kind of explain what this is? Well, you know, I have, as I said, I've always interested in anything that can make life more rich. Yeah. And I heard about uh, something called Newcom, and they, it's the only patented brain uh, technology. And they it came out at, it was $6,000 for earphones, and you had to listen to earphones and everything. I'd been a meditator all my life. I was initiated into TM in 1970. Uh, but this was supposed to take you into a, a real spacious meditation. And what happened for me was I realized as I use it now in the morning, since I'm alone in the morning, I don't have to get out of bed. I can just stay there, put these earphones on and move into this very creative space where I get all sorts of creativity and so on. And then it turned into an app not long ago. And I heard that Tony Robbins insists that everybody that he works with be using this. Yeah. And it's good for sleep. It's good for all sorts of things. So I reached out to the company and told them that they needed me as a spokesperson. And I wear this like this little thing on my wrist, which increases the brain frequency. Gotcha. So I use that every morning. And people can just go to Newcom. It's N-U-C-A-L-M. And if they put in the word Diana, they'll get 15% off for the rest of their life. And you can just try it out. There you go. We will make sure we put that into the show notes so when everyone's watching, dig around to figure out how to get in touch with you and follow up with you. Speaking about that, we do want people to know how to find you and learn more about the amazing, magical Diana. Here's the <laughs> website. What are they going to find there? It's dianawentworth.com. It's really simple. I'm going to put my new photos, which are much more crazy and outrageous and playful, <laughs> up very quickly. Um, instead of doing coaching, I'm going to be offering tea with Diana, which feels like the real me. And people can make an appointment to have tea with me for 90 minutes and talk about anything that you want to talk about. Ways you might reinvent yourself, uh, all you know, anything. We can talk about cooking if you want to. Uh, but I love meeting new people. I think it's so great. I'm always inspired by people and the creativity they have and how it sparks my own. Fantastic. So make sure to hit the QR code, check it out. And if you want to talk to her one-on-one, she's got the 90-minute block waiting for you. Just sign up, get to know Diana a lot better than that. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> you never know who's going to beam in, do you? You never know who's going to drop in with you. Right. I'm curious about two more things here. What's your favorite dish? What's what's the thing that you love to serve up? My mom has two family favorites. She has macaroni and cheese, but she puts a crusty little crinkles on top of them. Everyone loves it. And she has a chicken to die for. Okay. Well, this is easy because my first recipe I ever learned, my mother made the most fabulous fudge. And I fudge has a, is a metaphor to me because, you know, it was invented out of a mistake. So somebody up in New England was making taffy or caramel or something like that. And it seized and it turned into fudge. And this is the actual, our national candy dish. But I love the fact that it was born out of a mistake. <laughs> and so I learned to make the world's best fudge. I really did. Mm. I have at least 40 blogs up there. You can find them on my website or you can go to divinefudge.blogspot.com. 
you'll find my fudge recipe and all sorts of my all my other favorite recipes and all my travel writing and i incorporated all the things i love into my blog i'm so glad you asked that question oh no and and fudge come is there a good I, mint fudge in that collection someplace is there a good mint no but there you know there's a pumpkin fudge Ooh. that my family likes even better than the chocolate fudge and it has a, a toasted pecan on the top and it's so good and so easy to make finally diana what's in your future because you're not done yet as i said in the open you're looking and spreading the love and the magic and the joy what's I can't, next for you? Wait. I can't wait to find out i'm i'm interested in a project called ignite humanity um I just, I just want to find out what the world is going to show up in front of me right now because I can count on that. I trust it, Richard. Yeah. It always happens. I expect magic and there it is. So I'm going to spend the next three months with a friend, a business partner. She and I hold wisdom circles for women around the world. And I'm going to stay with her for three months. I will probably help my daughter buy a house. I have a fabulous daughter named Dr. Lexi Wellenetz, and she's very successful, but now divorced and starting a new life herself. So maybe we'll find a place that has a little guest house or a little casita where I can set down some roots. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, just stay tuned, okay? We will stay tuned because that sounds so fun and so exhilarating. Diana Wentworth, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. What a joy, a real joy has been to talk with you and be here today. Oh, Richard, you are fabulous. You are contagious. Thank you. <laughs> Diana Wentworth, again, chicken soup for the soul. She's got cooking. She's got it all going on. But the big thing is you want to take away joy today. You want to take away that joy and the sense of adventure. There is something magical going on around you. You do want to go find it. Don't be afraid to step into it. Remember, she just got rid of 90% of her stuff. And look how happy she is and how free she is. Go take the time. Go step, step out and go take a risk or two. And that's going to do it for this edition of Rock the Stage Show. Remember, we're here every Sunday night for Rock the Stage Show. Amazing guests like this talking about their careers, but also talking about their passions, their dreams. And we have a lot of fun doing it. Come back next week, 7 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of Rock the Stage Show. And again, you can find us on PPN, the Public Place Network or right on our YouTube channel. Subscribe, add in your comments, and we'll see you next week at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for Rock the Stage Show.